we're going to use the the terminal to issue commands on uh, issue commands to our operating system so that we can do different things and we want to do some very basic things to get started and that includes uh, moving about the file system, changing directories, creating directories, creating new files, uh, copying files, deleting files and then looking and, and editing files. So just some very basic things we do on a computer I want to introduce you to the commands we use in Linux on the command line. Some of you may know them already. So it should be easy. Uh, the first thing to get started, we're going to interact with our computer and, and what we see on the, the window is the prompt. This is referred to as the prompt. It's prompting me to, to issue a command. It has some structure which we'll explain as we go through. But then when I type something in, then press enter, it runs a command on my computer and executes something. Now, one thing that we need to know about is where is that command executed with respect to my computer? And where means which directory or folder is it executed in? So we need to know something about the structure of the folders and directories. I will use the word directory. Some people talk about folders but the directory and in fact the set of directories and files we refer to as the file system. Does anyone use Windows as their main operating system? Put your hand up. It's okay. I won't give you a lower grade. Right, so Windows, you, you use uh, folders and files. What is the, the top most directory in Windows? Again, program files, even above program files. C drive is, if you think of Windows talks in terms of drives, and maybe the topmost directory, uh, I don't know if it's still like that, don't type this, this is just a comment, but it, is it something like that, or, or like that? All right, so C drive, you can think, is the topmost directory in our file system. C is the drive, there may be other drives, and you can think that this backslash indicates the topmost directory because we have a hierarchy of directories. Underneath that are subdirectories. What are some of the subdirectories? Someone said one in Windows. Program files. I don't know. I don't have Windows. So please tell me. What are some other subdirectories of the top one in Windows? Program files. User or user and settings or something, and maybe system in the old days or Windows, temp, documents or whatever. But you know that there are some common directories from the topmost directory, and under them are further directories. So we say we have a hierarchy, and there's the topmost directory and subdirectories and so on. In Unix type operating systems. Unix type refers to the class included Linux and Unix operating systems. There are many variations. Mac OS X is a Unix operating system. Linux that we're using is a Unix type operating system. In that there's also a hierarchy. The topmost directory is represented by the character forward slash. Instead of backslash it's forward slash. The separator of directories is a forward slash. This topmost directory, we give a special name. We refer to it as the root directory, the root of our file system or the root of the tree. And under that are subdirectories and so on. When we run a command on the command line, it's run in some, some directory. Which directory? To find out, we can check the present working directory. So you can try the commands now, follow along. The present working directory, PWD, shows us what is what directory I'm currently in. And the answer from the from the root directory, the forward slash, there's a subdirectory called home. And from that there's another subdirectory called student. So we can think in the, the hierarchy or in the file system, I'm in the slash home slash student directory currently. Together this is called a path, the path uh, in the file system. 
I think you know this already, okay? The syntax may be slightly different, but you know the concepts. But PWT tells you where you currently are. The first thing we want to do is move between directories, change directories. We use CD to do that. CD will change between directories where we usually provide a, where do we want to go? Maybe I want to go into the slash home directory. CD slash home. What's rattling? Perfect, thank you, Sam. CD slash home takes me into the slash home directory. You may guess that it worked. There's a hint there, but PWD tells me now I'm in the slash home directory. Or CD into the root directory. Okay, the forward slash on its own means the root directory. We can't go any higher if we think of that the topmost level. And we can go back to the slash home slash student. So we can change directories. When we specify a parameter here to, or the option to change a directory into which directory, in all of these cases I started with a forward slash. This means it's an absolute path. Absolute means, in this case, it's relative to the root directory. But we don't need to start with a forward slash. We can have a relative path. Let's see what I mean. Currently, I'm in slash home slash student. Let's go into the root directory. And I can change into the home directory. I didn't start with a type it again. I don't start with a forward slash and now I can change into the, the student directory. So when we pass a parameter to the CD command, if it starts with a slash it means it's uh, from the root directory. If it doesn't start with a slash like CD student, it means relative to the current directory. We were in home, we CD into the subdirectory of home, which is called student. So we can move up and down in the hierarchy. In fact, an easier way to move up is a special type, which is dot dot. CD dot dot moves up in the hierarchy. I was in slash home slash student, I moved up to slash home. If I go up again, I'm in the root directory. So dot dot means upper level from where you currently are. How do I go home? You don't want to go home yet? Is that what you're saying? No? Alright, good. But if we want to get our home directory, of course there are different ways. We can type in the specific directory, slash home slash student. And we're in our home directory. And it's common in, in our operating system that our operating system supports multiple users. One user is called the student user, one is called instructor, one is, and there are some other users on this each computer. And those users have their own private directory in the slash home directory. So we are logged in as the student user, our home is slash home slash student. If I just briefly show you, I'm currently in this window logged in as the instructor user. My home is slash home slash instructor. Okay, different users have different homes. Same as, what is it? Users and settings or documents and settings or whatever it's called in Windows. Different users have different directories. Now, as an example, let's go back to the root directory. A quick way to go home is just type CD with no arguments. CD on its own will always take you home. Uh, 
Another shortcut for the home directory is the tilde character, the squiggly line. As an example, go into the root directory, cd tilde also takes me to the home directory. So that the squiggly line, the tilde character, it really means your home directory. And that can be useful because we can talk about directories relative to our home. We'll see in a moment. That's a little bit about directories, but more importantly, what about files? And what is inside directories? So I'll go home, make sure I am there, yes. We want to see what's inside a directory. We want to list the contents of the directory. We use ls. ls returns what's inside this current directory. And in my case, it shows that there are four things, code, posters, svn, and vm. And as a hint, when it's blue on your window, it means those four things, those things are a directory, not a file. Normally we talk about files and directories. Uh, there are some other special types, but we'll deal with files and directories. Because I set this up, I know that those four items, code, posters, SVN and VM, are directories inside your home directory. So let's go into one of them, maybe the posters directory. And we can ls there and we see a set of files. And you can guess that they're files, right? extension PDF, and the fact that they're not blue is that they are files, not directories. Don't always rely on the color coding because different systems may have different colors and also some may be black and white or someone may be colorblind. So there's another way to show what is a file and directory we'll see shortly. Actually, we will see now. So ls shows lists the contents of a directory. Uh, we can pass uh, arguments to ls. We can not just list the current directory, but list a specific directory. ls slash. List the contents of the root directory. And it shows in the root directory there are some subdirectories called bin, home, lib, root, user and others and some special files. That is the like the C drive directory and some of those directories are common across many different Unix like operating systems. Here's an example of listing the contents of a directory, VM, relative to my home directory. The tilde or squiggly line means slash home slash student. So that's really the same as doing this. The tilde is just a shortcut there. many commands, so we've seen pwd, cd, ls, we'll see more. Many commands have options, extra features, and they usually specify using a dash as an option, a dash followed by a letter. So ls, currently it shows the list of files in my directory. I'd like to see the file sizes. So I want to see the, the list of files and get the long output, I'll use the minus L option, ls minus L. And now we see that same list of files, but we see some more details about each of those files. The same way in Windows that you can show the file list in the Explorer as icons, or you can show the details. I'm not going to explain all of this information today because some of it may be come up later or is not relevant just yet. But 
going backwards, say for the biographies.pdf file, there's the file name, the date and time of the last modification of that file, when it was last modified. Files actually have different timestamps associated with them, not just when they were modified, but when they were created. This is the last modified time. What's this? The size in, what's the units? Bytes. This is the size in bytes. So this file is uh, about six megabytes, this PDF. The next two, going backwards, are something about who owns this file. Because we have multiple users on the computer, each file has some ownership. One particular user owns that file. Which user? The student user owns the file. There's also some ownership with respect to groups of users, not just the individual user, but a group of users. It turns out in this computer setup that there's also a group called student. This number one, not relevant. It's about links to the file. Let's ignore it. These 10 characters. The first character, if it's a dash, it's a file. If it's the letter D, it's a directory. We'll see another example in a moment. The next, ten, the next nine characters are about the permissions on the file. Can we read, write, and execute that file? And that's related to the users. We're not going to cover that today, the permissions. Right? But just be aware uh, to find the file size and the date and time, even the owner, use ls minus l. If I ls minus l dot dot, meaning upper directory, we see that these are have the letter D, meaning they are subdirectories. So that's how we really know it's a directory or file, whether that output is a D or a dash. Let's go home. Sometimes I may use clear just to, to clear out the screen, so if things are at the top. You don't need to. You, if you did, you fail, okay? No, it's all right. I'll just do it so it's a bit clearer on the screen. You don't need to because it's sometimes useful to see what you've just done. Uh, LS. There are four directories we know in our home directory. In Windows, you have hidden files and directories. Okay, some files and directories are not displayed by default. They are what we refer to as hidden files and directories. The same in our Linux operating system, we can have hidden files and directories. I know you all love security and cryptography and learning about security. Hidden files are not a security mechanism. They're hidden from a presentation perspective. It's easy to see them. To see them, use ls minus a to see all files. This shows you the hidden files and directories. And if you look closely, you'll note that the hidden ones start with a dot. So to create a hidden file or directory, just create one that starts with a dot. Dot profile is a hidden file. Dot bash alias is another hidden file. Dot cache is a hidden directory in my home directory. Minus A shows us all files. Minus L gives the output in long format. We can combine options. Sorry, that was maybe some people didn't see it. LS minus A minus L. To, you can do both. Or as a shortcut, just LS minus A L. In any order. Minus A L L A. Show me the long format output for all files. You can change into those hidden directories just the same as a normal directory. I'm going to keep going with a demo, but make sure you ask the, the TAs, uh, get their attention and, and ask some questions as we go.
Uh, we'll get some time to have a break a little bit later. Let's create some things. We're in my home directory. Let's make a directory, MKDIR. And then supply the name of this directory I want to make. And let's change into that new directory. And let's maybe make some others. So MKDIR makes a directory. We'll make some files shortly. Uh, we can change in directories. Doing things on the command line, of course, you realize we need to type a lot. Sometimes we'd like to speed things up. So there are often keyboard shortcuts that we can take advantage of to speed things up. One of them is the autocomplete feature. So in my example, I've got three subdirectories, security, Steve, and test. I want to change, I know I've got them there, I want to change into the test directory. So CD, wrong, and I type test, but I'm, what I can do is I can type T, instead of typing E, I hit the tab key. So the tab key, hit that, see what happens? It auto-completes for me. So if you start to use this auto-complete, you can save on your typing and speed things up. If I type CD, I want to go into the security directory. I know it starts with an S, CD, S, press tab, nothing happens, press it again. Because there are two possible directories that start with S, it doesn't auto-complete one of them, but if I press tab twice, it shows me those two options. Security or Steve, which one do you want? I type E, press tab again, and there's only one unique directory that starts with SE. Security. It works on files and directories, many things. So the tab key on your keyboard is used for autocomplete. We can remove directories, RMDIR, RM for remove directory. Another keyboard shortcut, if you want to run a command that you've previously run, you can scroll through the previous commands using the arrow keys on your keyboard. On your keyboard, try the up and down arrow. If I press up, it scrolls through the previous commands. Down takes me back. I want to make the directory Steve again. Done. The up and down keys, the arrow keys. back in my home directory. Let's remove this directory, ITS352. What happened? It gave me an error message. Often, when a command runs, if it's successful, it doesn't print anything on the screen, unless there's some output, like LS, like but CD, RMDIR, and so on. Here it's printed something. Right, I've tried to remove ITS352, but it says that directory is not empty. There's something in it. RMDIR, by default, will not let you remove a directory if that directory has something in it. So that's just a, a precaution there. 
if I want to do it, there are different ways, but I could remove the subdirectories first. Now, so I could remove, I will not do it, I could remove the directory ITS352 slash security, then remove the test directory. What's in there? Let me check. To make the example a bit of, a little bit more fun, I'll make Steve again. You can name yours different, but in my case I have security, Steve and test. I want to remove all of them. Then I can use RMDIR now, or I can, to capture multiple values, I can use some expression, regular expression, and a simple way is to use star. Star means all values that match, anything. They're all gone. I'll make mine again just to illustrate that. I've got three directories, security, Steve and test. Maybe I just want to remove the S directory, security and Steve. RMDIR S star. Remove everything that starts with an S. We're left just with the test directory. So the star, this wildcard value, can be used in many places where we use files and directories. When we list LS, uh, when we make things, edit files, copy files, we can use star where necessary. Before we move on to files, one last special directory, the current directory. If I do ls minus AL. I'll just ls minus AL. There's a subdirectory called test. It, it shows me that there's a directory up. But it's a bit strange, but it keeps track that a, there's a directory above my directory. Dot dot. We know, and it shows me dot means this directory. Dot is a special character that we use to refer to the current directory. CD dot just takes you to the same directory that you're currently in. It's, it's not useful there, but we'll see in later uh, uses. The dot refers to the current directory. These commands are on the printed reference card in front of you. The middle sheet printed on your desk is the commands I'm going through. Let me see if I've got it. Available on the course website. The reference sheet you have in front of you printed and you have it in every quiz so you can use that in the quiz we've gone through directory operations special directories some of the ls options we'll now go through some file operations I'm currently in my home directory. I already have this ITS352 directory. Let's go into that and make some files in there. There's nothing in there. Actually, there is. There's still a test directory. Let's get rid of that. ITS352 in my case is empty. It doesn't have to be. Let's deal with files. And a very basic thing, let's create an empty file. 
An empty file is, there's, think there's a placeholder for the file, there's no contents, we can use touch, followed by a file name. Choose any file name. Touch creates an empty file. Empty means there's, uh, the file system has a record of the file, but there's no, no, no data in it, and we can check by using ls minus l. The size of the file abc.txt that I created with touch is zero bytes. Right? We don't commonly do that in, in this lab, but sometimes it's useful to create uh, something for testing purposes. We can create files with touch. Uh, but a better thing to do is to create a text file and, and use a text editor. What's your favorite text editor? Notepad. Nice selection. Notepad. Any others? Notepad++. Okay. Any others? Text edit. Many, there's many different text editors nowadays. Okay. Notepad comes standard on, on Windows, but very basic. Well, same on, on Ubuntu Linux. There are di different text editors installed and we can install others. But on the command line, uh, to just to get started today, we're going to use one called Nano. Nano. You type in Nano and it opens the text editor. Press Enter. Nano. And we can do our normal text editing. Down the bottom of the window are some menu items and the, the hat character or the this character means the control key. So down the bottom you see if you press control G you'll get the help. Control X will exit. Control O, write out, means save. Write the file to disk. Control O says what's the file name you want to write to. Let's give it a file name. You can use a different one, myfile.txt. Press enter. It wrote three li lines. It saved three lines on disk. So my file is saved. Uh, there are other options. One that we may use briefly today, you want to copy and paste. Normally we don't have the mouse available. Right? Or we will not rely on the mouse. So let's try and do everything with a keyboard for now. Copy and paste. Well, a simple or a quick way to do it, we can use Control K to cut. Control U to uncut. Uncut is like paste. Control K. And control, control K cuts. Control U uncuts. So that's a quick way, and it works on lines. There are other ways to do it on, on uh, selected text. Let's make a file which has lots of lines in it. Right, just want a file so that we can use it for testing. Let's exit. Doesn't matter what's in your text file. I want something with lots of lines in it so that we can use it uh, with some other programs. Control X to exit. It prompts me to save because I've modified the file. Yes, I want to save. Y for yes. What file name? Just press enter. I don't want to change the file name. Now I have a file of 711 bytes. Let's find a few more statistics about the file. We can count the words in my file. 
WC, word count. It's more than just the words. It says there are 42 lines, 145 words, and 711 characters. If I just want to know the number of lines, minus L is an option. Word count minus L, my file. 42 lines in my file. For today, if you can't remember the commands, then use the reference card printed in front of you. Over time, as you use them, you'll start to memorise them. But sometimes remembering the options, minus L, is there a way to show just the number of characters or the number of words? Well, sometimes it's hard to remember the, all the detailed options. So we can try some help. And usually commands have their own manual. And we can access the manual using the man command the manual page or the man page followed by the command is like showing the help for that command. Try it. Man WC. This is the help page for the WC command. And you can scroll up and down with your keyboard. Up and down arrows. If I want to print the bytes only, minus C. The characters, minus M. The new lines, that is the lines, minus L. The words, minus W. So I now learn a bunch of options for WC. We can scroll up and down. Press Q to quit. This is a special type of uh, text editor. To get out of it, press Q. This is the man page. Most commands have, a, have their own man page man ls all the options for the ls command minus a it has many options sometimes I'll ask a quiz question I'll say how to do this particular thing where you've used the command but you need to go and find the option to get the very special case read the man page Q to quit Let's do some more things on our text files. We've created a text file. We've uh, did a word count. Let me just clear and show what I have. I've got two files. One of them's empty. My file contains some, some content. Instead of using a text editor to, to display the file, there are some other commands to display. A very simple one is called cat. Cat is not an animal, but it is a program that shows the contents of a file. It's short for concatenate. It simply prints the contents of the file on the screen. Cat, followed by the file name, prints it on the screen. You may have noticed in my case, because there are lots of lines on that file, when I did the cat, I missed the first line. So instead of using cat, sometimes we can use less. Less, again, shows the contents of the file on the screen, but page by page. And now I can scroll up and down with my arrow keys. So it's got the top lines, and I scroll down, and I get to the bottom of the file. So less is, a, is slightly more advanced than cat. Cat just shows it. Less shows it, but, but has page breaks. Q to quit less, like the man page, Q to quit. You want to just see the start of a file, the head of a file. Head, by default, shows the first ten lines of the file. Or the end, the tail. Tail shows the last ten lines of the file. You want to just get the first three lines of the file. Head minus N3, my file. Or the last five lines. You can actually do minus five as a shortcut. Minus N3, 
or simply minus three shows that selection of or that number of lines either head or tail. Cat shows the full file, less shows the file page by page, head shows the first n lines, tail shows the last n lines. The reason we have all these commands on files is because many programs in Linux and Unix systems are configured via files. The operating system configuration is not done in a registry or a separate database but in plain text files and similar for many applications and many programs on the command line use text files to do processing. So it's useful to be able to process those text files. Let's copy some files. CP to copy. Copy my file.txt to new.txt. And we now have a copy of that file. Copy doesn't have to go to the same directory. I can copy my file back a directory and change it the name to another file. And if we look in the higher directory, we see that new file. So copy uses a source and destination. The source and destination can include the, the path, the directory of the file. What if I want to copy another .txt into my current directory? How would I do that? I'm in ITS352. In the higher directory, there's a file called another.txt and I want to copy it into this directory. Copy another.txt from the higher directory. What's the destination? The destination is this directory. The shortcut for this directory is dot. Copy another dot txt from the higher directory into this directory. And we now have a copy. So be careful, or make note that I used the dot there. When we do a copy, we must always specify source and destination. Sometimes we can use the dot to represent this current directory. Move is similar to copy. Move new.txt upper level. New.txt is gone from this directory. It's now in the higher level directory. Move moves the file. We can move it back. I move from the higher directory new.txt into this directory. Moving a file is also the same as renaming a file. You want to change the name? Here I simply rename u.txt to xyz.txt. So we can use move to rename. Note that we can rename files and the names of files in Linux, the extension doesn't matter. In the examples I've used, I've used .txt because we, we knew they were text files, but the extension is not important. If I change the name and use a different extension, it doesn't change the format of the file. XYZ 
is still the same text file as before. Contains some text. I can move XYZ to XYZ dot doc. It's not a Microsoft Word document, it's still just a text file. Extensions are not necessary and are not necessarily interpreted. So we can use any extension, but it's common sense to, or common practice to use an extension that is informative to the user. And the last thing, we can remove files. RM followed by the file name. Or let's remove all of our text files. Star.txt. When I say text files, I mean those that I've given the extension .txt. RM removes or deletes files. There is no recycle bin. There is no trash on the command line. If you delete a file, it's gone. So you need to be careful. In the graphical interface, there is a trash bin, but we're not using that. When you delete a file here, it's no longer available. So be careful when you remove files, especially if you use a wildcard like star. RM star, delete everything. If you have a thousand files in that directory, they're all gone. Sometimes uh, the permissions on directories mean you can't delete everything, but you can do some damage if you can delete, delete your own files accidentally. Before we have a break, let's do the last few things on files. Let's uh, find some files on our file system. I'll go home. Clear. I'm in my home directory. Often we want to search for files. That is, somewhere on my hard drive there's a file that I'm looking for. I know the name or the, 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 the structure of the name. There are different ways to locate files. One is using locate. Locate followed by a file name. Maybe Wireshark. I know there should be some files about Wireshark. Wireshark is installed. Locate may tell me about those. And it tells me all the files that have the name Wireshark in it. And you, you can scroll up and down, I will not, but it returns a, a whole set of files, the complete path, the subdirectory and the file name that refers to Wireshark. So locate. Okay, if there's no file, then it will return nothing there. Locate. I had X, what? ITS 352. Locate XYZ dot doc. This is interesting. I have a directory called ITS 352, and I, inside that I have a file called XYZ dot doc. If I try to locate, xyz dot doc it doesn't return an answer locate is a very uh, well locate uses a database of files to find the answer it's very fast to find the answer but the way that it works is that oh, maybe the past hour or so the operating system has done a search for all the files and put them in a database but it's not up to date recently I've created xyz dot doc if I try to locate it, it's not currently in the database. So locate cannot find that. So locate is very quick, but doesn't cover all the files. So a more powerful command to find files is using find. It's more powerful, but slightly more complex. Find, the pattern we'll use, find, specify the directory we want to search in, and then the option dash name, because we want to find based upon the name. 
star dot dot. So there's three arguments to this find command. The directory I want to search in, including the subdirectories. Then I say I want to search based upon the file name because actually you can search on other criteria, file size, creation date, permissions. And I want to find anything that ends with a dot dot. And that finds xyz dot doc. So it, it does an actual search. If I want to search from my current directory, it's good practice to include the double quotes, uh, especially when you use a wildcard there, the star character. Find searching through my current directory files with name that end with .pdf and it shows me all the PDF files. What if I want to find all the PDF files on the hard disk? Find slash dash name star dot PDF. That is search from the root directory and end including all subdirectories. And you say it may see many results. You may also see some errors, permission denied errors. So it searched through the entire hard disk, returns all the PDFs, but some directories the student user is not allowed to access to, to do the search through. So you'll often see permission denied in there, but you, many results. We can locate files although it doesn't get the most recent files, more powerfully we can find files using the command find. The last way that we commonly use to search for files is to search for application files or executables. Before we searched for Wireshark and it returned many directories. Files related to Wireshark. But I want to find where is the application Wireshark. So there must be a program, an executable on my computer that is Wireshark. We can use which. It's in slash user slash bin. ls is also an application. It's in slash bin. Nano is an application. So these are the executables, the things that are executed when we type the command. It's in slash user slash bin. Bin is short for binary and it's usually, it really means the application, the program, the executable. Which searches for programs, locate and find, search for any type of files. So I'm back into my home directory. Uh, let's go into my ITS352 directory. What's in there? My xyz.doc. Make sure you have a file with a few lines in it. Doesn't matter what's in it. Uh, I'll just check mine. xyz. All right, my file has some text in there. One thing that we need to know is how to process text files. So we've seen some commands for de dealing with text files, displaying, showing the head, the tail, word count. Uh, it's very powerful if on a command line we, if we can automatically process text files to help configuring our computer. So the next thing we're going to do is first search through a text file. And one way to search through a text file is called a program called grep. And a simpler way to use it, grep, then you specify a pattern. What do you want to search for? Maybe I want to search for the word example in my file. And grep will return all of the lines in that file that match that pattern. In my file, yours may be different, so maybe your word you search for can be different. Depends on what's in your file. Mine returns three lines inside the file which contain the word example. So very simple. Search through the file, return all the lines which contain that pattern.
we can use wildcards there if we want. What did I do there? That's a bad example. Don't use a wildcard there. Let's avoid that one. The grep. So what I did there was a mistake for what we want to do. Grep has a number of options where we can specify regular expressions and use wildcards and other special characters to match different patterns. But we will not deal with those right now. Uh, it takes some time to look at the, the syntax. So let's simply stick with searching through for particular words in a file for now. So grep can search through files. We can do an inverted search, find all the lines that don't match that word. Again, all the lines, the minus V for inverted is all the lines that don't have that word. And it shouldn't show the ones with example. So a very quick use of grep to search for a file. We'll see some other examples later. Next thing. Up until now, all of the programs we've been running, we've interacted with, with those programs by running it and then they usually show something on the screen. So grep, for example, printed out the answer on the screen. The screen is how we get the output of this program, but in fact we don't have to print it on the screen, we can put it inside a file. So we're going to look at how we can put the output of a program in a file rather than printing it on the screen. And it's quite easy in fact. Do that again. Grep. I want to search for all the lines in my file which don't contain the word lines. If I do that, those lines are printed on the screen. What I can do is redirect the output of that program using the greater than sign into a file. I can name it what I like, my output.txt, run it, see what happens. It doesn't print anything on the screen. The grep program run, runs, but the output of that program is redirected from the screen, which is called the standard output, the standard location to put the output, and is instead sent to, into a file. Now let's look inside our file, my out. We can use less. Look inside your file, see what you get you see the output of grep. So this concept is called redirection. We redirect the output of a command to some other location. And the very common way we do it is redirect the output of the command from the screen to a file. ls we know it has ls minus l as an option, sorry, the long output. We can ls a particular directory, ls minus l slash shows from the root directory. We can also recursively ls. A recursive ls means show me the contents of that directory and its subdirectories and their subdirectories and their subdirectories. It keeps going. That's what the minus uppercase R does with ls. Let's list all the files on our hard disk. It may take some time to list them, you see. It's going through the hard disk listing all of the files. To stop that, because I'm in too impatient, you can try control C. Control C kills or cancels the, the program from running. That was ls minus l minus r, uh, uppercase r slash. 
maybe I want to know all the files on the hard disk instead of show them on the screen put them inside a file now what's happening here are some errors being displayed the files themselves are not being displayed but the error messages are what's happened when a program runs that program produces two types of output the program produces output the, the standard output from the program, the normal output it, 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 it produces when there's no problems but if there are error messages they are also printed on the screen but the error messages are considered separate from the standard output what you see on the screen now are the set of error messages from the command I run. With redirection and the greater than sign, it only just shows the normal output and puts it into this file. The error messages are still printed on the screen. The concept, and it's on one of the slides on the, the website, The concept is with any command, when we run a command, there are in fact three ways, three uh, interfaces to that command. There's the input to the command. Some commands take you or accept input from you. We haven't seen any yet. We may see some later. But some commands we can supply input. It's called the standard input. Then the command runs and the command does something and it produces two types of output. The normal output, the standard output, which is the expected output. LS shows a list of files. GREP shows a list of uh, lines that match some criteria. But if there's errors, it may also print error messages. There goes my mouse. And that's referred as the standard error. So, there are three interactions to a command, the standard input, the standard output, and the standard error. Normally, the standard input comes from what we type. Both the standard output and standard error are printed on the screen after when the command runs. That's what normally happens. With redirection, using the greater than sign, the standard input is normal, that doesn't change. The error messages are still displayed on the terminal but with redirection with a greater than sign the standard output is saved in a file. Okay, so instead of printing it on the terminal it prints it into a file. So we can look at it later. It's very useful to get a record of what's happened. You don't want to look at it as it goes, you want to look at it later. Redirect into a file. There are different options. You can redirect both the standard output and the standard error into a file. Note the difference. Here's the ampersand character and the greater than. With just greater, greater than, the standard output is saved to a file, but not the errors. With this one, both the output and the errors are saved into a file. And there are other variations. One of them, the common one we'll use is this, just greater than sign run a command, don't print the output on the screen, print it into a file. Another one, which I don't have on the slides, if you use two greater than signs, it appends to the file. One greater than sign overwrites the contents of the file, two adds to the end of the, of the file if it exists. So let's try those two commands again. The others with the ampersand will not try, I think will not use. Let's try a couple more redirections to files. Just check that command I run. All files.txt. It's only uh, 30 megabytes uh, in size. That, if we have a quick look at it, not all of it, of course, 
it's the list of all files and directories on my hard disk, except for those which I didn't have permission to look at. I'm going to delete that. If you created one, delete it so you don't take up space. We'll do a few more simple redirections. And to do them, let's introduce some other commands. Who are you logged in as? If you forget who you are, then ask the computer. Computer, who am I? Okay, who, who am I tells you the current user you're logged in as. In my other terminal, I'm logged in as the instructor. Okay, there are different users on here. We can redirect the output of who am I into a file. All right, so instead of printing on the screen, it just goes inside that file. Another command, echo. Echo echoes that string onto the, the terminal. Very simple. Whatever we type after the echo is printed. It does nothing other than print on the screen. It's like a printf statement in a, in a programming language, or a print statement. So we can echo into a file. And if we want to append to a file instead of, instead of overwrite it, use two greater than signs. Name already contains student, and now I'm going to append to the end of that, hello. Two greater than signs echoes, one of them overwrites, just to confirm that. If you just use a single greater than sign, you'll delete what was in the file before. So the greater than sign, the two greater thans, and there are some other variations are called redirection. Redirect, especially the output to a file. Next, and another new concept, is that when we run commands, often we'd like to do more complex things than, than what we've done so far, and we can do that by running multi multiple commands, not just one after the other, but run a command, take the output of that command, and use it as input to the next command. And this is called a pipe. Combine multiple commands together using a pipe. Let's see some examples. What's my IP address? I told you at the start, 10.10.16.201. What's yours? Do you know the command to find it? Who am I tells you who you're logged in as. Your IP address, is, which is not the topic for today. I think we may have seen it last semester. You may have seen me use ifconfig. You don't need to remember that yet, but it's useful for the example. ifconfig shows you details about your interfaces. And if you scroll up, you'll see your IP address somewhere. Which interface does you, has an IP address for you? I don't have scroll on my terminal, so I will scroll up here. I have config, I note ETH0, 10.10.16.201, and I note that's the internet address, INET address. I don't want all this other information, I just want my IP address. So what we can do is maybe try grep. Run I have config and take the output of ifconfig and then use that as an input to grep searching for inet address. Which 
Try that. Where the way to combine the two commands is this vertical bar, which is shift back, uh, back, not backspace, what's that? Backslash, backslash is the key. Shift backslash. This is called the pipe character. It means take the output of the first command and use it as input to the next. And it returns all lines which were output from ifconfig which match inet addr. And we see two there. Can we improve upon that? What if I just want the IP address? Now let's run ifconfig again. But we can run ifconfig with a sub option with the specific interface I want. This is a little bit outside of the scope today. We'll cover it later. But with ifconfig it shows I have ETH 0, 1, 2 and LO. I'm looking just for ETH 0. So ifconfig ETH 0 and now grep into inet ADDR, the internet address, and I get a single line which includes my IP address plus my broadcast address and a network mask. I just want the IP address. So let's try and do some operations on that single line. There's different ways to do it. We can take that output and pipe it into another command. This other command we can use, one is called cut. Cut takes a string of text and splits it into chunks where we can specify the delimiter let's say is the colon character that is the chunks are separated by that character and the chunks are actually called fields this is going to take this line of text and cut it up into fields separated by the colon character, so this would be field 1, field 2, field 3, I want field 2. That's what the minus F does. What do we get? Can we do another cut and just get the IP address? Let's pipe that into another cut. The delimiter, what, is a space maybe, field 1. Now I've extracted my IP address from ifconfig and, ex and removed all other information. There may be better ways to do that, but and it uh, may only work in certain cases, but it's an illustration that we can combine multiple commands together using the pipe operator, that vertical bar. And in doing that, I've introduced this new command of text processing called cut. And the, a simple way used to use cut, we specify the thing that separates the fields, the delimiter, and it can only be a single character, and then we specify the fields that we want. And cut is given on the, the, the Linux reference sheet as well. Many commands can be combined using the pipe operator. As long as one produces output and the other takes some input. What's the port number used for a web server? Everyone remember a common quiz question? Not this week, later weeks. The port number for a web server? Not 50, starts with an 8, 80. Different applications have different port numbers. Some we won't remember. On the Linux operating system, there's a file that lists the set of port numbers. It's in the etc directory, and it, the file is called services. Again, this is outside of the scope for today, but we'll use it as the example. we can see the port numbers of different services. 
Secure shell servers, use port 22. HTTP, if you scroll down, uses port 80. And others. Q to quit. Maybe we can search through. Rather than having to browse through, let's look for all the lines that contain HTTP. And we get, well, we get a few extra lines that we don't really want here. Uh, If we want to filter out, we can actually specify the specific word of HTTP. It gets rid of some. And then we could, actually we don't even need the word, we could pipe that into a, a cut and get rid of the comments, for example. Separate the fields by the hash character, grabbing only the first field. Maybe you want to sort them. So all I'm doing is building up one larger command by combining them, the smaller ones, with pipe operations. Sort the output. HTTP dash alt becomes before HTTPS. Maybe we just want to cut and get rid of everything before the, after the slash. So just another example of building up and getting information from a text file especially using pipe, grep, cut, sort and some of the other text operation uh, commands can be used in the same manner. Last week we introduced some, some basic commands to get around on the, uh, in the Linux operating system. So we'll continue today uh, uh, and look at some different things, look at uh, running processes, connecting to other computers, uh, and a little bit about permissions, who can do what on a, on a computer. The first thing we'll look at is processes. And when we run a command, ls for example, ls is actually a program on, on this computer. We know that if we use which, ls, ls is actually an executable installed on the computer in the bin directory. So when I type ls, that is, the program is executed, it does something, that is it lists the, the files or the directories, and then it stops executing. So that's common with most commands. It starts uh, the application, it does something and it stops. We talk about that it starts a software process, a process uh, runs, does something, and then ends. So we want to look at that in a terminal, normally we just r run one process at a time. I type ls, I press enter, ls executes, the process runs, stops, then I do another command. So just sequential. We can do more complex than that. We can run some processes, leave them running, and then run some other processes. So we'll introduce how to do that. The concept is that we can have one process that we can run and interact with by typing things in, and then other processes we say are running in the background. They're running, but we don't interact with them. So let's see how we do that and give some examples of why it's useful. First, let's see one of our commands we did 
we did last week ls. If we want to list all of our files on our hard disk, ls minus l shows us in the long format. And there's a minus r option, recursive. And we want to list everything on the hard disk, so let's list all files in long format recursively starting from the root directory. Recursively means list the files in that directory and then all of its subdirectories and all of its subdirectories and so on. So essentially list everything on the hard disk. Run it. See what happens. So ls minus l minus uppercase r forward slash to mean list in the root directory. And when we run it, you see it prints all the files on the hard disk. There's some we can't, can't see. I want to stop. So the process is running. All right. I can't interact with the terminal. I can't run other processes while this one's running. It stopped. Okay, now I can run other commands, the next command. So that process took a long time. Or well, some things we may want to do. Maybe I run it and I realize I'm not so patient, so I run it again. How do I stop it before it finishes? One way is control C. So you don't see the command I pressed, but note down here it showed I pressed control C character there, or the two keys. So that stops it, or that's what we say, uh, yeah, stops or cancels a process. And sometimes we say we kill the process. So we talk about the process was running to stop it before it completes normally. Control C will do that, C cancel the process. So that's useful when you have something that you see is going to run for a long time and you realize you, you don't want to wait for the end. Or if you've done something wrong or done uh, typed in the wrong command and it's sitting there waiting for input, you've got no, no idea what to do, then control C will cancel or kill that process and you can return to the terminal and inter interact. Just to show that because doing that, uh, that to demonstrate that we need a process that will run a long time. The ls minus lr does run for a long time. Let's find another process just for the demonstration. Uh, I'll just clear that. Try yes. What does yes do? Yes prints Y's forever. This process will run for a long time. It will run until the, the computer shuts down. So it's just for, for testing, all right? So it just prints Y's forever. So how, would he, how do we stop it? Well, we can control C to, to cancel or kill the process. So we just use yes just as, as an easy demo of uh, manipulating processes. We can, so when the program runs, when I run yes, it's running, I can kill or cancel the process with control C and, that, and the operating system uh, stops the process and deletes any information about it. But we can also pause the process or suspend the process, put it to sleep. And to put a process to sleep, suspend control Z. Control C kills, control Z suspends or puts it to sleep. That is, the operating system still has some information about this process in memory. It's just not executing at this stage. It's stopped, it says on the command line. It's not running, uh, it, but note with it suspended, we can still interact with the terminal. We would like to maybe, if it's paused, to restart, to resume. So what we can do to see the set of processes that are stopped or paused from this bash shell that I refer to as jobs. What jobs are, are paused? If we type jobs, it says the jobs that are paused or suspended or stopped at this stage, yes, is stopped, and it's job number one. So that's a paused process. We can bring it back and start it again. And we say that there's always one process that 
can run with interactivity with the terminal and we say that process is in the foreground. So to bring that process back, we can say foreground followed by the job number is job number one, FG1. Or if you just type FG on its own, it will still work because it brings the most recent one pause back. But FG1 will bring our process yes back to the foreground, that is it's running again. Control Z will stop it again and we see it's listed as the jobs. Foreground will bring it back. FG followed by the number or if you want the most recent one just FG. It's now in the foreground. A process in the foreground, when I do something on the terminal, I'm interacting with that process in the foreground. All right, there's nothing to interact with this program. It just prints on the screen. So I can't run other programs at the moment. We can control C, kill the process. There's no jobs suspended now. So jobs list those that have been suspended or stopped. FG brings, can you be used to bring one that was suspended back to foreground and have it running again. So that's useful if we want to pause something and, and then go do something else in the meantime and then come back to that process. Let's try that in some different ways. Let's run yes and let's output that to a file. Remember redirection from last week, the greater than sign says instead of print the output of yes on the screen, print it inside a file. Try that. Then it doesn't take up the screen. It's running. The process is in the foreground. Well, I can't do anything. I can't issue commands. You can try and type, but I can't run anything. Uh, it's running. We can suspend it. Control Z, it's stopped. Just check the file. How big is it? One of the options for LS, if you want human friendly, H. Human friendly gives the, the, the prefixes. It's 2.1 gigabytes mine. Note that what yes does is just prints Ys to a file and, and does as fast as possible. So it filled up 2 gigabytes in those 10 or 20 seconds when I ran it. Note that it's not getting any bigger. That process is suspended. It's not running. There's some state information about it, but it's not running. If I want to start it again, bring it back to the foreground. Just check the jobs. There's only one. I can do FG1 to bring job number one back to the foreground. And it's running again. I'll suspend it again. And look at the file size. Mine's now up to 2.6 gigabytes. Okay, so that just illustrates that something was added to the file there. It started again. It's suspended, so it's not doing anything at this stage. We say it's, it's stopped. What we can do is take that process, instead of having a paused, have it run, but have it run in the background, we say. Have it run such that it's executing, but we can still interact with the terminal. And to put a process into the background, we use BG. BG followed by the process number, or simply BG, because there's only one, to, one job to deal with. BG puts that process into the background. Let's check the jobs. So now that job, yes, redirect to the out dot text file is running and let's check our file size mine's 4.7 gigabytes if I check again it's now 5.2 gigabytes All right so just to illustrate that it is running now but I can still interact with the terminal because that process we say is in the background and we can have as many processes as we, as we like running in the background how do I stop it I'm going to fill up the hard disk soon, so how do I stop my, my yes process? We could bring it back to the foreground. It's in the background, running. To bring it back to the foreground, simply FG or FG followed by the number. There's only one, so FG is fine. It's running again, and now 
it's in the foreground and I can interact with it via the terminal. The commands I issue affect that process. So I can control C to kill the process. Look at the file size. There's no jobs running now and that, that process is stopped. The file's not getting any better. It, it's gone. So really three states of our process. The process is in the foreground, it's running, and in the foreground means that when we interact with it via the terminal, when we issue commands, it's interacting with that process in the foreground. The process can be paused or suspended with control Z, means it's not running, but there's still some, the operating system stores some information about the process so we can resume if we like. And the third state is the process is in the background. It is running, but we cannot interact with it via the terminal. It's running in the background, we say. Let's delete that file so I don't fill up my hard disk. And I suggest you do the same. Let's do similar again, but we'll introduce different ways to, to do that. Uh, Yes, redirect to our file. It's running. I'll control Z to pause it. BG puts it into the background. So it's running again. It's a gigabyte. It's 1.5 gigabytes. It's two gigabytes. So it's running there in the background. So that's common. If you start a process normally and then you realize, let's put it in the background, let's have it running but, but uh, in the background, then a quick way to do that, control Z, suspends, and then BG puts it into the background so it's still running. You want it back? Foreground. And it's back. Back to the background, control Z, BG. So we usually combine those two, control Z followed by BG, puts it into the background. It's getting big, the file. Uh, we said to stop the process, to kill it or cancel, we use control C, but there's another way. So we see the jobs, that yes program is running. We can also see the processes, PS lists the processes. A little bit more detail. It's the processes that you, you're running in this terminal. And there are three listed. So this program PS runs a process that tells us what processes are running. Which processes did it list? It listed itself. That is when it runs, it records that it itself is a process running PS. Yes is a process that our operating system is running, the program that we've got running. And Bash, Bash is the software that interprets your commands on the command line. That's the, the shell software, we call it, the born-again shell. It's the, uh, it handles the, the commands that we can issue. So you always see Bash there as the output. You will almost always see PS, and you may see other processes that you've got running in the background, like Yes in this case tells us something about how long it's running and more importantly or useful for now is the process ID. The operating system assigns a process ID. We know yes has the process ID 5575. How big is my file? Only 19 gig, so we better stop it. Rather than bring it back to the foreground, we can kill the process without control C but using kill. Followed by the process ID. So that's why we use PS there to learn the process ID and now kill 5575. Make sure you choose the correct process ID. Yours will be different than mine. PS shows that yes is not there. We also got a nice inf information saying that yes has been terminal, terminated. Sorry, I did a mistake there. What do I do when I get a mistake? 
what's happened here I, it's it's waiting for more input i hit the wrong key i hit the the backslash key control c will get me out of that what i want is this so another way to kill the process is if you know the process id issue the kill command control c is uh, the keyboard shortcut the kill command will do it based on process id let me delete the file so different ways to interact with processes try them you know useful let's say i want to run my yes command and i know i want to run it in the background i don't want to have it in the foreground i don't want to have to suspend and type bg if you want to run a process immediately in the background then add the ampersand character at the end this means run the process and immediately put it into the background so we don't have to control Z BG, just add the ampersand character. And it's running in the background already. Jobs, this it's running. PS shows it's running. Process ID 5606. The file is 2 gig, 2.5 gig, and so on. So it's it's getting larger the process is running and we run it in the background using the ampersand character and you can do this for any command right we're using yes as a simple demo you know since I know the process ID I can kill that now when we run kill it tries to we, what we say gracefully shut down the process tries to end it normally and it's terminated let's delete the file just to clean up so kill tries to stop the process uh, like if think if um, say w in Windows you try to close a program and it will try and save the file before it exits that's what kill does a graceful shutdown but sometimes we can't do that maybe something's not responding so maybe in Windows you try and close a program and it, do it says um, it's not responding do you want to force a shutdown or, or stopping so we can do that with kill if we run our process again in the background process 5618 if something will not stop using kill then you can try even harder using minus nine that really means uh, even if you can't save any information just just stop the process for sure all right so this is just used if if something's not responding even with a normal kill it's not responding kill minus nine means really try hard to kill it and it usually works so that's useful if something's hung so that killed the process it's slightly different than terminating slightly worse than terminating the process so we can interact we saw PS list the processes and only by default shows the processes in my uh, this terminal running by me bash and PS so there's not m much interesting there if you want to see more because our operating system is running processes for different users if you want to see them all PS minus E will show lots of processes and I'll pipe it into less remember the gra the, the vertical bar means take the output of PS minus E and send that into the program less and less just shows me the output page by page so it shows me all the processes running on my operating system starting with process ID 1 the initialization process that, that starts everything and many uh, operating system processes for starting networking uh, all the different tasks and we scroll down we may see some we recognize there's a mysql server running apache web servers running there's processes for that and if we scroll down we get to the we may see firefox running secure shell server is running on my computer because all of you have logged into my computer so there's a process handling the login and to view the demo we're using software called tmux so that's running on my computer yours will be different
And if we get to the bottom, all right, P, S and less are running. So P, S minus E shows all processes. I'll quit that. Or if you want even more details, P, S minus F, uppercase A. And there are up other ways as well to show. P, S has many options. This shows all the processes, but it also gives things like who is the user that's running that process, the user ID. The student user is running these processes. The root user is running the instructor user. On my computer is running some processes because I'm logged in as the instructor. The root user is running some processes, the, the, the core operating system. PS shows us process information. One last way to see process information, we can see a real-time feedback is to use top to show the top processes. Try top. This gives us uh, every one second an updated list of the processes. Plus the top, the first five lines show us some summary statistics about the processes on our operating system, those that are running, or the total number of processes. There's one running and there's many sleeping. Something about the CPU utilization, the amount of memory. We have 16 gigabytes, how much is used, the amount of swap space and so on. And then the list of processes. And usually it's, well by default it's sorted by the amount of CPU they're using. Yours will be slightly different from mine because I'm running some software in the background. I'm, I'm recording the video and audio and the process, sorry, it doesn't show here, but on yours you will see on the, the right side the process name. Mine's running some recording software. So there are many options with top. You can change which items you sort by, but we'll not go through them. If you want to see the processes interactively, use top. In Windows, this is like what? In Windows, the task manager. You can bring up the task manager and see a similar output. Q to quit. So I'm just showing you how to find this information. So that's the main commands we use to interact with processes. There are others, but that's uh, the most common ones. We can we can do this also with processes which start graphical programs. So we're doing everything on the command line, but from the command line we can start GUI-based programs. We know that we have Firefox installed, uh, the, the PDF viewer, so we don't have Acrobat, it's called Evince. I know that Evince is the, a program that opens PDFs. So they are two programs that open up a separate graphical window. We can interact with them as processes as well. To demonstrate this, I need to switch to another window where I'm logged in as instructor on my computer. So let's do that. I'll just close my instance of Firefox and then we'll start it on the command line. And to start Firefox, we type the command Firefox and it opens up the, the web browser and note that that process is in the foreground. From our terminal's perspective, we can no longer issue commands. Firefox is the process running in the foreground. I can't do other things while fi Firefox is running. So that process is in the foreground. But I would like to do other things. I'd like to have both windows open. Well, we can close it. We could interact with it, same with any other process. I'll control C, kills Firefox. We can run it in the background by adding ampersand. And there was a bit of an error or a warning in my case, but it is running just to show I can do LS now. So I can now run commands on the terminal and at the same time use Firefox. Okay, so this is useful when we have graphical programs started from the terminal. We start them in the background so that we actually have both of them running. We can bring it back to the foreground. 
and Firefox is still running but I can't interact with it in the shell, in the terminal. I can suspend it, control Z. I can now run commands. Can I use Firefox? The process is there but it's suspended or paused and the, the window manager has shown that it's greyed out because I can't do anything on Firefox now because it's not running, it's paused. So I can't do anything. I'd have to put it into the background if I want to use it at the same time. Now I can do something. So remember, the foreground means that the process is running and it's, it's got control of the terminal. Paused or suspended means it's not running, but there's some state information stored about it so we can resume later. Background means it's running, but we don't have control of it via the terminal. We can run other commands. Firefox is running. It's also started another process, maybe some plugin for plugins on Firefox. If we kill the Firefox process ID, it kills Firefox, it produces some error, but let's ignore that. It kills its children as well. So when we killed Firefox process, the children process of Firefox were also killed. So we lost that plug-in container as well. So we can interact with processes using control C, control Z. There are some other ones as well. Uh, FG, BG, foreground and background, jobs, PS, and the ampersand character to start a process in the background. Let's look at users on their system. Who am I? Remember, who am I returns the current logged in user, the user for this terminal. If I run it in a different terminal, I'm a different person. I'm instructor on this terminal. Who am I for this terminal? I'm logged in as the instructor and here the student user. So who am I returns the user. What users are on this computer? So we know we're logged in as student. You can guess there's an instructor user. Which other users uh, have accounts on these computers? Can anyone tell me? What other users are there? Well, when you have the quiz question, how are you going to find the users? Well, there's different ways. Remember, think about your home directory. The normal case is each user has a home directory. I'm currently in slash home slash student. The student user's home directory is slash home slash student. So we'd expect other users would have slash home slash username. Let's look in the slash home directory. ls slash home and see what other directories are there and that may tell us about some of the other users. And I'll use less because I know there's a long list there. And we see there are a bunch of users. And we guess that these are users because they have home directories and you recognize some of the names. So that's a quick way to see something about users. Maybe a, a more precise way is that the operating system stores a list of users and when a user logs in, the operating system needs to check the username and password. So when you log in, you, you supply your username and password and the operating system checks what you supplied against who's already had an account created. So the operating system stores the list of users in a file. Let's have a look at that. For Linux, it's common that configuration files for the operating system are stored in the etc directory, etc. But that's a common place to store config files. We use less to look at. There's a text file in there to list the text file that stores the list of users on this system. 
is passwd, short for password, because the, the usernames usually have passwords associated with them. So this is a text file that lists all the users and some information about them. Have a look at it. The format is one user per line and on each line for each user where well, there's some fields separated by the colon character and we'll go through one of the examples, the details. First we note there are many users here, the root user, daemon user, bin user, sys user. The root user is the admin. So you, you can log in as the root user. It, they have a home directory, a special home directory. It's actually slash root. And you can do things as of the root user if you know the password. The daemon user and many of these others are what we call system users. And they're not real or normal users that can log in. They used to run operating system programs or, or applications, servers usually. So normally we don't use these users. They're not something we can log in as. And you may note at the end it says something about no login. So it's a special type of system user. If we scroll through, uh, so system users are for special operating system tasks. Uh, I think somewhere you'll see MySQL, there's a, for example, there's a system user for running the MySQL database server. We don't log in as that user normally, it, uh, it's just for running the server. So we want to focus on the normal users. There's a root user, system users, the normal users, there is instructor. You scroll down, you see some they start to recognize. TA, student, and then what I've done, as you notice, I've set up users for each of us, or each of you, based upon your name. So just some, some fake user or user accounts that we can use for testing. Let's look at the student user. The structure of this file is for every line, the first field is the username, the second field is the password, the third field is the user number, so we have a name and a number, so a unique number. Users belong to groups and they must be in one group. So this is the default group they're in, the, but the group number. This information is some uh, human friendly information about the user, maybe their full name. So note, well what's different here, the S, uppercase S. This may be displayed on the graphical login when you, you see your name there. Note for the named users, I haven't uh, given the full name, I've just repeated that the username. But you could see the full name here, the, the email address, the phone number and so on. This is the home directory, all right, slash home slash student, and you see most of them are slash home slash username, that's the default setup. And this is the software that runs when this user logs in. And we've said before, bash is the software that interprets the commands on the command line. It, it understands what you type. So that's the normal setup. We care about the username and the password. Well, you notice that the password for all the users is X. It's not the actual password. The X here means the password information is stored in another file. All right, so it's not actually stored in this file. This is the operating system list of users. Where is the password information stored? It's in another file. It's called in the shadow file. So let's have a look at that quit, Q to quit, open up the shadow file. That stores the password information for those users. It will include the usernames and then information about all their passwords. And you can see the password of all the other users. Well, no, you can't. Right? So the normal user cannot see the password of other users. By default, the permissions are set up so that you cannot look at this file. It is a text file, I'll show you later, but the normal user, the student user in this case, cannot look inside this file. They can see the set of users in the passwd file, but they cannot see the password information in the, the shadow file. That's the security measure to uh, do some access control.
we can change between users. All right, so we, we do everything as the student user, but you may have realized that I've created a, a separate user account based on your name. It's your first name followed by the first letter of your last name. And you can log in as that user just for, for uh, doing some small tasks or demos. So to change users, we can switch between users using SU. And I'll just choose a, a random user from, from the list. You, you switch to you, okay? Type in your name. SU switches users, switches to that user, and you need the password for that user. And for this I've set up, it's the same as your username. So I'm now logged in as a different user. If I go home, CD, I'm now in my the home directory of this, this second user I'm logged in as. So now everything I do, I do it as as this named user, not as the student user. SU switches users. Very simple. Just note the password was the same as the username, just so we can easily uh, switch between different users. Some of the tasks today I'll say use your named user, that is switch to the name, the user based on your name, not the student user. If you want to exit, and go back to the other user, use exit. And now I'm back as the student user. So SU switches to the named user, exit comes back. I can switch to the root user, or if I just use SU, switch user on itself, it by default goes to the root user. The other meaning of SU is super user. Super user is like admin or root user. So SU and on its own, we sometimes think means Switch to super user. And I log in as the super user, which is actually named the root user. Who am I? Root, CD. Note their home directory is slightly different. Their home directory is just slash root. Right? Of course, you need the password to switch to other users, and you don't have the root password, so you can't switch to the root user probably wouldn't be too hard to guess it, but there's no need for. And as the root user, I can do anything, uh, including look in the shadow file. So the shadow file is the one we said stores the password information. And we see it's similar, it has a username and then some information about the password. Let's go down to our student user and look at the password information. The password information is this long field. The numbers at the end are something like when you last change your password, when you need to re, re, uh, change your password in the future. But this is the long field which is the password information. You m notice it's not the password. We know the password for student is student. This is not the password. We don't in in fact, we don't encrypt that, the password. We do something which has the similar purpose. We calculate the hash of the password. And we'll cover this in the security and cryptography course. What we do is we take the password, we attach another usually random number, this value here between the two dollar signs. It's called the salt. We take the password, we give it some salt to make it more tasty, and then we hash that salted password. We use a hash algorithm, hash algorithm number six, and the hash takes that input and generates a, basically a random output that is for that particular input, and that random hash value is here. So the idea is the password information, the password itself is not stored, but a hash of the password is stored such that even though we can see this file now, you can't see the password. And to find the password given this hash value is practically impossible because the cryptographic nature of the hash algorithm is that if you have the hash value as output, it's practically impossible to t find the original input. Okay, so 
that's a security measure so that no one can see the actual password even if they can see this file. The other security measure is that the normal users can't even see this file. When a student logs in, they supply their password, the system calculates the hash of the password and compares against this value. And again, another property of the hash function, the hash of two inputs which are the same will produce the same output. If they match, the user logs in. We will see the details of that in authentication in security and crypto. So you can see the hash, but you can't see the password. Q to quit, exit out. Last, last command uh, when we're talking about users and permissions. So we saw that some users cannot do some things. That is, the, the student user couldn't look at the shadow file. We'll return later after the break about uh, permissions on files. But similarly, some users cannot run programs. Right? Some pro programs are protected, especially programs that give you special privileges or need special privileges on their operating system, like network type programs. I'll just switch to my other terminal because I need to be logged in as the instructor or uh, uh, not to a different user. Uh, but you can do it as the student user. There's a program called IPTRAF. It shows us the internet protocol traffic, the IP traffic. It's a networking program we'll use in later labs. Just to, It shows the packets being sent and received. Most networking programs, or some of them, are, are protected. Not any user can run them. So when I r try to run IP traff, it says this program can only be run by the system admin. We don't have permissions to run it. But I would like to allow everyone to run it so that we can actually see the network traffic. Uh, so a common way to do that is to set up the computer so that some programs, the student user and the instructor user, can run these special programs. And I've set that up. What we want to do is we want to run this program as the system administrator. The other name of the system administrator is root, or another name is the super user. So we'd like to do this program as the super user. Do IP traff as the super user. Super user do IP traff. And you've heard of sudo, I think, before. The idea to do this program, run this program, as a different user, as the super user by default. We can actually switch to a different user if we want. And that tries to run this program as the super user and I've set up these computers so that you're allowed to do that. It asks for your password. You should be doing this as student, not as your named user. I'm doing it as instructor. I type in my instructor password and I see that it returns an error in my case because I've zoomed in too far. Try it again. Okay, so sudo followed by the command tries to execute that command as the super user. Now, it needs to be set up in advance as to which commands you can try. You can't do anything with sudo. You can try or return an error if you try other things. And just to demonstrate, IP traffic just shows some statistics about packets being sent and received. There's not much happening on my computer. Just shows packets being sent and received on my computer. So sudo allows us to run a command as the super user or as the, the root user when it's protected commands. We'll use that later in some, some networking commands. If, it doesn't, if you don't have permissions, try sudo first. X to exit. So... We can switch users, we can run commands as super users using sudo. We've seen a little bit about where passwords and user information is stored. Later we'll see permissions on files. We've seen already that some things that we, we can't access, some files we can't access. The student user couldn't see the shadow file, it said permission denied. If we try to run some programs, it may be permission denied. So 
So there are some permissions on files. In general, every file, and a directory is a special case of a file, every file has some ownership, the person who owns it, and some permissions. What are you allowed to do with it? So that's what we want to look at briefly here. Uh, I'll log in as a, a named user and I suggest you do that too. So we're as one of our named users. Note that when you log in, you're in the student directory. But that's not my home. I've logged in as a named user, so I want to go home, CD. And now I'm in my home. So let's create a file. Just to demonstrate here, echo some something into my file. And just be, to make it clear, who am I? And let's look at the details of this file. So I have created a file, abc.txt. When we see the details, we see the file name, the date and time. And the, this column tells us the user that owns the file. Right? Every file has a user that owns it. It belongs to one person. So by default, when you're logged in as a user, when you create a file, you own that file. We'll see later we can change who owns it, but by default we own that file. The second column, and yours will be different, the second column shows the group that owns the file. So in fact, each file has a user, an individual user that owns it, as well as a group that owns it. And a group, as you may guess, contains a set of users, one or more users. And when we say the group owns it, it means anyone in that group can do some things, some special things with it. So with respect to this file, we say there's one user that owns it, there's one group of users that own it, and then there's all the, the rest of the world, everyone else, the others. So on our computers, we saw there are, what, 100 plus users. For this file, one of those users owns it. Some users are in the group, blue one, that own it. And then there's all the other users, the other uh, 99 users or, or however many there are. So we'll distinguish between three sets of users. The user that owns the group that owns, and others. Others are not the user that owns and not in the group. User, group, others, U-G-O. We'll come back to those letters. So, the ownership for those three sets of users, user, group, others, they can do different things potentially with the file. What things can they do with a file? Well, there are three main operations in Linux. We can read a file, means open it and look at the contents. We can write to the file, which means modify the contents, uh, delete, modifying. Deleting is just uh, the same as modify. So write to a file means change or edit. And in some cases, we may want to execute files. If it's a program, we make it executable. So we can read, write, and execute. And the three letters, R, W, and X. X for execute. So, what can our user do with this file? How do we know? These nine characters tell us. Have a look. The first character tells us if it's a file or directory. This dash here says this is a file, not a directory. The next nine, we split them into three groups of three. So let's look at them. These three characters. Just zoom in so everyone can see. R, W, dash. The three characters in the order of read, write, execute. Read, write, execute. So these three characters belong, uh, specify the permissions of the user that owns the file. So the user that owns the file, what can they do with it? They can read it because there's an R there. They can write to it because of the W. They cannot execute because there's no X. If they're, if they're allowed to execute, there'll be an X there, not a, a dash. 
So our user can read and write the file, but they cannot execute. That's what this tells us. The next three characters are what the group can do with the file. Anyone in the group blue one is allowed to read the file, write the file, but not execute. The last three characters are what others can do with it. Others, in this case, cannot do anything. They cannot read, write or execute. So that's how to read the permissions. You may see an R here, I think, in your case. Right? Or the default in your case may be an R. That is, others can read it. Let's try, zoom out. Here, this example. The reason I had didn't have an R here is because uh, that file was already created and modified before. The file XYZ, read and write. The user can read and write. The group can read and write. The others can read only meaning the others can look inside the file, but they can't modify it. They can't write it. No one can execute. So that's how to read those nine characters. If you can't remember, they're on the reference card in front of you. Okay, It takes some time to practice and remember them, so we'll have some practice. Now what we'd like to do is to change the values. So let's try. Who am I? First, what groups am I in? Type groups. This tells me the groups I'm in. So we see I'm in a group that is based on my username. That's usually the default group. Everyone's usually in a group which has the same name as their username. And in these computers I've set up so that this user is in blue one group. You will see, hopefully, if you've logged in as your user, you're in a colored group as well. The color based upon the desk and probably the colour followed by the number 5, section 5. So these are the groups I'm in. If you want to see what people are in different groups, there's a file in the ETC directory called group. And you can look in that. and it lists all the groups on the system and you scroll down and you see who's in red, blue one and it lists the, the users in that group. So there's one way to see who's in a particular group. That's similar to the past WD file, it shows, but this shows information about the groups, not the individual users. etc slash group. The command group shows what you're in. So, our file xyz.txt, I would like to be able to change, I would like to be able to change who owns the file, the user that owns and the group that owns. Let's change the group. There are different ways to do it. ch own, change the, change the ownership. CH own, change ownership, and we take two inputs, the, the, user the username that we want to own, colon, followed by the group. Don't copy mine, use it for yours. So maybe you can change it so that previously it was owned by this user. I don't want to change that. I want the user to be the same. But the group was this one. I want to change to blue one in my case. Maybe you change your file to be in your colored group and the file name. Change the ownership of this file. You see the, the group has now changed from the original group to blue one. So in fact, that changed the group only. You could also change the user as well, but there may be some restrictions on which users you can change to. There's a short way to change groups, CHGRP, change group. So 
So I've just changed it back to the original group. So CH own changed the user and the group. CHGRP changed just the group. So you can use either. Let me change it back to blue one in my case. So we can change the ownership of files. We can also change the permissions on those files. And sometimes it's not called permissions, it's, it's the, the modes at which we can access that file. There are three modes, read, write and execute. So we can change the mode for the file. So the, to change the mode, chmod, change chmod. And this is a little bit complex, but if you remember, there are three sets of users. The user that owns, U. The group that owns, G. Others, O. And there are three types of modes or permissions. Read, write, execute, RWX. So we can add and subtract permissions, plus or minus. Our current file, the others can read the file. Let's change the permission so others cannot read. O, subtract or revoke the permission to read that file. So the, the syntax here is specify the, the set of users and then either plus or minus usually. Plus gives the permission, minus revokes the permission. And then what permission? In this case, read. The R's gone. I subtracted the R's meaning for the others, meaning other people can no longer read this file. If you're the user, you can read it. If you're in the group, you can read it. But if you're anyone else, you cannot read it. And you can have other combinations. chmod, the group, don't let the group edit the file. Group, subtract the write permissions. Now the W has gone here. All right, so the group can only the group users can only read, they cannot write. If you want to change that back, you can grant permissions or add permissions. Plus give them the permission to do that. And now the W is back. CH own changes the user and the group that owns the file. CHGRP just changes the group. CHMOD changes the permissions. And you can set combinations based upon user, group and others. Grant or revoke, plus or minus. Read, write, execute. And with that you can set up uh, what you aim to do to, to, to secure the files. So this needs practice, so what I'll do is just put up a couple of tasks that you can try, very simple, uh, and just learn some of the syntax for chmod and chown, try some different things. Do this as your, your named user, not a student, and to test that the permissions do what you expect. And the way to test is to get your friend to log into your computer and see if they can read the file. So try to set up some permissions so that it protects some of the files. To get started, what can you do? to show the groups you're in, you run groups. I'll just leave that up there. To change the mode, chmod, to change the owner, chown. You can also use chgrp and some tasks. And just so it shows on the screen. Very easy task, but try some others as well and get your friend to test by see if they can access those files. Get different friends to test one that's in the group and one that's not in your group and see if you can set different things up. 